Great. So, uh, no, no, I'm going to go up. I'm going to introduce everything, and then I'll interrupt so you. Stand up. But um, that makes it all the more uh, wonderful, I think. Thank you very much for coming on this very wet uh, afternoon. Um, um, my name's Peter Pomerantse. For those of you who don't know, this, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, you're at the Legatum Institute, you probably know that, uh, which is an <laughs> uh, educational um, charity and think tank. And I'd like to thank the uh, Legatum Foundation for their generous support and to make our whole program and our many other projects at the Institute um, possible. I mean, our, our vague agenda for those of you who aren't here regularly is uh, trying to promote this idea of prosperity through revitalizing capitalism and democracy. And uh, one of the projects that we have is the Transitions Forum. Uh, and underneath that is a small project that I run uh, called Beyond Propaganda, which looks at developments um, in propaganda across the world. Uh, the last big event we had, uh, we looked at how authoritarian regimes are becoming much cleverer and how they befuddle their own populations. Uh, we looked at Venezuela, uh, China, uh, Syria, and, and so on. Today, the focus is on a subject that a lot of people think they understand, but actually they don't understand it at all. Uh, it's about this very overused term, information war. Um, when I first heard of information war, um, I kind of imagined two propagandists shouting at each other. Um, here's a um, capitalist propagandist shouting at communist propagandists, and each one tries to persuade the other one that he's right. Um, then, as I began to read more about information war theory, especially in Russia and China and other places, it suddenly dawned on me that, that actually, when they talk about information war, they're not talking about it the way media talk about it. They're talking about a military theory, uh, the use of information for various military aims, um, to throw the opposition off balance, to uh, divide and conquer, and so on and so forth. All of this had very little to do with information, as I understood the term as a quasi-journalist. One of the most <coughs> overused words in the discussion about information war is a word called narrative, which, which I thought, again, that I understood as somebody who'd studied sort of literature once upon a time and someone who tells stories, I always thought that narrative meant, you know, well, kind of anything. Uh, um, you know, it's uh, uh, the clothes you wear or, 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 or the argument you make uh, during a discussion. Mark Laity, who I'm going to introduce now, who's one of the authors of our wonderful new publication, Information at War, is actually going to start today's public event with a much deeper look at how people in his profession think about the word narrative. Mark is absolutely unique. He's a former journalist, BBC defense correspondent for 20 years, something like that, but then crossed to the other side and now is head of strategic communications for military operations at NATO. I almost got that right. You did. So, so and he's going to actually kickstart today to get our sort of... Um, to get our ideas flowing with a look at how people in strategic communications in the military think about narrative and how they understand narrative. So we'll do that and then we'll bring on our other authors. So, uh, Peter, thank you. so this is slightly unusual. Um, what I'm going to show you is a shortened version of what we actually do in the military to take narrative and turn it into policy and then to turn that into strategic communication. So bear with me, because this is a little bit unusual. Um, most people, when you say narrative, you think story. But it, as Peter said, it's an incredibly overused term, and yet it's very important. And the reason is, is that we live our lives in narratives. We're all living our own narrative. Our family, our background, our country, each one of those contains a narrative. We're a little bundle of narratives. And if I want to persuade you to do something, I need to tap into your narratives, to speak in a language you understand. Not just the language of English, in this case, but your story. 
your family. Because if I don't tap into that narrative, then I don't speak to you. So, here is a scene of medieval Kiev. So why am I showing you this? Because it's about history. You see the phrase at the top, an unending dialogue between the present and the past. Now, there is a statement. Kiev is the mother of Russian cities. Ancient Rus is our common source, and we cannot live without each other. That's Vladimir Putin. And he said that the day that they annexed Crimea. So there's a narrative. Ukraine, Russia, we're together. We're one. What's NATO's, what's Russia's strategy with Ukraine? Russia wants to embrace Ukraine. So its strategy is to, in effect, critically influence, if not absorb Kiev. Its narrative is, hey, our background is the same. So the strategy and the narrative line up. The same thing we have here. This is St. Vladimir, the Prince of Kiev, and this is what President Putin said about him. President Vladimir predetermined the <coughs> overall basis of the culture, human values that unite, unite the civilization of Russia, Ukraine, and of Belarus. Now, the Eurasian project is Putin's grand strategic vision. He wants a Eurasian Union. And what are the three key elements of his Eurasian Union? Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. So he is using a narrative attention. We're all the same. We all share Prince Vladimir to achieve a strategic effect, strategic narrative. So let's look at that a little bit more. So at the top, I've got what I've made up, but I think it's accurate, a narrative one-liner. <coughs> The fascist junta in Kiev illegally toppled the government. They're oppressing our Russian brothers in Ukraine who desperately needed and wanted our help. All very emotive, right? Narrative. So, why is he saying that? Because it helps justify Russian military intervention. Because if our Russian brothers are being oppressed, why wouldn't we intervene? So, the narrative is aligned to the strategy and it's mutually supportive. We'll come back to that. Notice, too, the historical narrative. You know, the appeal before, fascist junta. Nasty. So, fascism is something Ukraine's against, Russia's against. World War II, the Great Patriotic War, the Ruski Mir, the Russian world. All of these things appeal to Russians. They also appeal to a lot of Ukrainians. They appeal to a lot of Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Multiple narratives. Now, Russia wants to appeal, and a lot of this is legitimate. You know, you want to appeal to many audiences, you frame your, your story. You want to appeal to this kind of audience? Okay, so you don't like America? Then they have a narrative for you. We want a multipolar world not a unipolar world. So who's that going to appeal to? New nations who are growing powerful and think it's their time for a place in the sun. Russia has a narrative. You're conservative, right? Well, Russia is an outstanding supporter of conservative values. They have a narrative for you. You don't like America. Russia has a narrative for you. So they have multiple narratives. And if you look at Russian statements, you will see there's something for everybody. And then they use tricks and techniques. The fascist junta in Kiev. Now, a fascist junta, let's face it, it's not good, is it? <laughs> All right. Now, that's what you call framing. If you call it a government, that's what it is. You're not framing it. You call it a fascist junta, you're already thinking this isn't good. Now, these are standard tricks. Everybody could do them. But the Russians along with others, but especially the Russians, they do a lot of these things, mirroring, framing, priming. Standard tricks. Any ad agency can help you. So now look at the bottom there. There is another one-liner. Now, if you look at that, sorry, I'm just going to sit down to see that. In order to pressure and destabilize the Kiev government to prevent its westward orientation, we will use 
active and as necessary military measures to provoke and then regain Crimea and as necessary a separatist enclave in eastern Ukraine. Okay? Now, that's actually pretty much what they've done. That's a strategy. But if you look at that bottom statement and then look at the top one, they're the same. Just one is framed as a narrative, a motive, resonant, and the bottom one is a strategy, a strategic narrative. Now, we can all do this. The three elements of successful communication go back to old Aristotle. Logos, pathos, ethos. Argument, passion, moral authority. The most important one is not argument. That's the least important one. We like to think we think, but in fact most of us don't. The things that drive us are our passions. And what we do is we listen to people with moral authority. You may be regretting it now, but you're listening to me because you assume I'm an expert, right? So you have lent me some authority, and hopefully I'll live up to it. So you've given me the ethos. But I'm telling you, whether you like it or not, the pathos is more important to you than the logos. So how do we turn this, make this real, you know, because this is all very esoteric. But I'm a chief strategic communication. This is what you'd call a narrative arc. Now, Steven Spielberg could use this. It's the basic four-block approach to how you do a story. You have a problem. You want to solve it. You then do various stuff to solve it. And then at the end, you've solved it. And you ride off into the sunset with a girl on the back of the horse. OK? Standard narrative. But look underneath there. You have a situation, objectives, execution, end state. What that is, is the four standard phrases that you would use to create a military plan. So satisfaction becomes end state. So actually, you have an alignment between a narrative and a strategic plan. Who knew? And when you say that, we do this. This, you can see from the top, is the ISAF narrative. This is a real narrative. It's out of date now, so don't bother taking it down. Um, dating from 2010. And they actually used the narrative form to create a narrative for how we did communication in ISAF. And then they turned it into <coughs> reality by putting it at the top of the hierarchy. So you see left and right, campaign plans, stratcom plans, effects plans, on the left, subordinate narratives. Every part of ISAF was using this narrative to do real operations. Not just messages, but real operations. So when they planned a military offensive, at the top of the hierarchy was the narrative. So, we then, how do we then turn this into an effect? We use a thing called frameworks. So we have an introduction, no core message. We then say the objectives. The military love objectives. We all love objectives. What are we trying to do here? What's the aim? What are we tr and this is a something that's essential. It's no good just saying stuff. Where are we trying to go? Remember our narrative arc. And then we have themes and focus topics. That's what we're going to do, our events. And then we have coordination. Because I'm not just talking about communicators. I'm talking about people who fly airplanes, drive tanks, drop bombs, dig wells. So we have to coordinate with all of those. So let's then turn that back to, to whoops, that's not so good. There we go. Let's turn that back. So there's our narrative. Then we have our strategic plan. And then we have our STRATCOM framework. And see how they all align. Now, I show this because we do this. This is actually what we do. And let's turn it then into today. There's our friendly narrative arc. So what's our problem with what's going on in Ukraine? Well, the Russians are a challenge to the post-Cold War order. We had rules. The Founding Act, the Vienna Document, the Helsinki Act, all of these things 
which said, this is how we do business. And the Russians are challenging them because they want to re-establish a sphere of interest. They don't want to take control of Georgia or Moldova or Ukraine because Ukraine wants to. They want to do it because they're bigger, because they think they're entitled to. So there's our problem. So now what are we going to do? Well, we need to protect the rules-based order. We need to give small nations choice. So what actions are we going to take? There's our art. Well, we've taken sanctions. At NATO, we're providing assurance to nations that are worried. We're supporting the threatened. We're living our values. We don't respond to lies with lies. And then we have an effective narrative. And then, if it all works out, and this is in the future, mutual security is respected. That includes Russia. Russia's entitled to security as much as the rest of us. But every nation, big or small, is entitled to security, to secure borders. So there you have it. Now, that is not a plan. That's a framework which then needs to be implemented. But unless you know what the problem is, unless you know what you're trying to do, unless you know where you want to go, then it's just tactics. It's just running around doing stuff. You need to have this kind of approach in order to decide how to do it, to make sure you know it. So, a very short run through, but that is how we think and do stuff at NATO. Thank you very much. God. It'll be a short pause, mate. Yeah. Well, we move the scenery around. <coughs> put Lauren there. there and just put. Um, I'll sit. I'll sit. Yeah. Aha. Um, possible to switch off the uh, the video projector. Great. Mark, thank you very much. The first time I saw Mark give a similar presentation was in Kiev, and the room was full of Ukrainian generals and bureaucrats. And I don't know, I, the, 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 their, their eyes looked interested, but yet very, very kind of like shocked that this was the way to think about sort of military strategy. Um, uh, this is also a very good time for me to say thank you very much for everyone who's joined us online. Uh, that we are much more than this, uh, this small room, <coughs> including sort of trolls and hackers. I'm, I'm very glad you're with <laughs> us as well. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit. So that was a fascinating insight, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about how NATO thinks about well, uh, narratives in, in an age of, of information war. But let's go back a little bit. Um, one of the fascinating um, pieces uh, of, your, of your essay here is that you deal very briefly with the Russian idea of what is information war. Could you lay that out very, very basically yeah. for us? What do they mean when they say information war? The, the term that the military use is information confrontation, um, which is interesting in itself, um, the fact they refer to it as a confrontation. And it's a multi-phase effort in peace and war. It starts with covert operations, it goes through all sorts of stuff, then it becomes active, then you have your crisis, and then it's re-establishing peace and order. So we tend to think about peace and war. The Russian approach at the moment, the military approach, is best described as information confrontation. They've done slides on it. Um, I'm not making this up. This is not even controversial, frankly. And when you see the slides they've done from their own chief of defense staff, you'll see that information confrontation <coughs> bridges between peace and war. And it goes from covert actions until the end. So potentially, they are carrying out information confrontation, warfare if you like, long before we think war has started. So it's, sort of, it's a, per a perpetual thing, a bit like sort of Trotsky's uh, permanent revolution. It's permanent information war all the time, regardless of whether two countries are officially at war or not? If, if they have an objective, if they, they're effects-based. I mean, if they're happy with the way things are, they won't be having an information confrontation. They're not. So if they have a plan, if they want to get somewhere, they are not going to wait for us to decide a war started. They will start it. So 
You know, the, the military used the term effects-based. <coughs> the Russians are very effects-based. Where do they want to go to? And they want to go to places, and they want to do it, if possible, without going to a, what the military would call kinetic actions, in other words, a proper war. So if they could do and succeed in their objectives without a shot being fired, they're going to do it. But the thing is, is that they are conducting that information confrontation. Laura, spinning the globe um, to the other side of the world. Um, I was quite surprised in your paper to find that the Chinese idea of three-way warfare sort of echoes the Russian one. Can you, can you give us a very quick description of, of what is the three warfares? Sure. So it's very interesting what you say, Mark, because it's very, very similar to what the Chinese do today. They see the three warfares, if I quickly define them for you, are um, media warfare, uh, which is a constant ongoing activity that's aimed at influencing perceptions, influencing public opinion. They'll use uh, Xinhua, they'll use CCTV, all of their major news uh, platforms, they will use that in order to influence public opinion. Um, secondly, they have psychological warfare, so they really want to disrupt an opponent's decision-making capability. So that's targeting really civilians and military um, in order to influence doubts, to, to foster, you know, sort of a second guessing uh, of an opponent. And then thirdly, you have legal warfare, uh, or also called lawfare, which is an exploitation of existing legal, um, legal customs, legal systems, um, so leveraging particularly the law of the sea. Um, and using that to a particular effect to uh, blur legal distinctions, to leverage it in a way that isn't, um, it, it, w it wasn't <coughs> designed to, to be used in a way. So, and again, this is really pre-kinetic. So, I mean, they, they sort of, they've learned from Sun Tzu in terms of winning without fighting. So essentially, they want to be able to use the three warfares to condition their operational environment to their advantage so that they never need to get involved in any sort of infrastructure destruction, you know, kill ratios, you know, the tangible things that in the West, and particularly in the US, that is used uh, to define military success. Well, I was going to ask, because, I mean, uh, for those of, uh, of, of in our audience who aren't familiar with your work, I mean, you were director of research on a, on a massive 500-page, actually, it reads like a thriller, um, sort of Cambridge University study for the US Department of Defense. Um, but, you know, that's sort of like the immediate question as a journalist that I get is like, well, doesn't everyone do this? Don't, don't the Americans do the same thing? Don't we do this? Black ops, you know, it's, 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 you know, uh, it's, it's not as if the West is sort of like, doesn't know the term information operation. So is this different and how is it different? Um, sure. Well, I mean, the, the, Interestingly, the Chinese have actually learned from what the US did in, um, in the two Gulf Wars, so the way that they were able to leverage sort of UN sanctions, be able to use the media uh, you know, campaigns, they have learned from that. And there's not really anything new per se in terms of looking at psychological operations. They've been doing that for, for thousands of years. But what is new with this is that it's been co um, combined and it's really applied in a holistic and a concerted way. So it's approved in 2003 by um, the Chinese Communist Party by the, the CMC, which is the Central Military Commission, so the supreme leading organ of the armed forces. So it's really got top-down direction um, that perhaps it, it wouldn't otherwise have if it was um, just applied in its disparate way. So it's really this concerted whole uh, being able to be applied against multiple people, multiple audiences, in multiple scenarios uh, for a really, um, essentially, very cost-effective way. Give us one small example, just, just so that we're very clear of sort of the three warfares in action. Maybe, no, no. Um, you know, the South China Sea seems to be the main yeah. sort, of, uh, uh, sort of field, uh, the battlefield that we're sort of familiar with. I, I don't know, maybe some of you have started seeing these slightly bizarre stories of the Chinese suddenly creating islands uh, in yeah. the South China Sea. G give us a little bit of how that isn't random, that's actually part of a much larger strategy and a, and a way of looking at war. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I don't know how many people are familiar with the South China Sea, but there's lots of reefs, lots of submerged rocks. And what the Chinese are essentially doing is dredging the, the seabed, getting all of the sand, pour it, putting it on top of each other and transforming that into an artificial island. And then the three warfares really come into play. So firstly, in terms of legal warfare, they're then saying, OK, so this is an island. It's legally justified. This is our national territory. Therefore, under the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, it generates a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles, and it also generates an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles, which means that it has complete access to all of the, it can regulate its own economic activity. So that's legal warfare, but it's also trying to blur distinction. So under international law, um, within that 200 nautical mile limit, um, you cannot regulate the activities of foreign navies. 
So you can't say you need to get prior permission until you, uh, before you bring your ship or you fly over our airspace. But China are basically saying, no, you need to get our permission before you do that. So that's legal warfare in action. Psychological warfare is that it has been sort of bombarding Vietnam, the Philippines, um, all of the other claimants to these islands in the South China Sea in terms of um, you know, putting oil rigs within their strategic territories like it did with Vietnam in May 2014. It moved an oil, oil rig closer to their, um, their coastline um, and then it moved it back. But again, just before Vietnam's top leader visited the US to try and get closer US-Vietnamese uh, ties, it moved it back. So it's signalling, we're not happy with what you're doing. And then that again is served up for sort of um, domestic and international consumptions via its media. So they'll ram home saying that um, these are all um, Chinese territory, look at what Japan is doing, look what Vietnam is doing, uh, particularly with the way that Philippines has taken it to The Hague. They're saying, well, this is, this is just stirring up trouble. Ben, I mean, listening to both Mark and Laura, um and what strikes one is the ability of an authoritarian regime, as opposed to a democratic regime, to sort of, um, well, Laura used the word holistic, which actually I think is one of the times where actually the word holistic is really the right word to use. Uh, a bit like narrative, it tends to get, get overused. But um, uh, it sort of really takes sort of uh, legal warfare, economic <laughs> pressure, um, diplomatic games, um, media, and to kind of unite them all. Um, because unless you buy into sort of the, the theory that the BBC, um, I don't know, um, uh, all British companies, Google, are all actually run by a shadowy person underneath number 10, um, I assume that's much harder for a democracy to do. I mean, you worked, but you're a, a very well-known analyst of information warfare. You're also a, a press officer at NATO dealing with Russia. Um, what can democracies do, or, or are they always going to lose at this game, or should they maybe even start, I don't know, do, do they start abandoning some of their democratic instincts and start creating their own uh, media and economic sort of centralised institutions? Uh, <coughs> to take your last point first, no they don't, because frankly the authoritarian regimes are always going to be better at being authoritarian than we are. We still have democratic checks and balances, we should say thank heaven for that. But you cannot possibly get a democracy being as good as an autocracy at being autocratic. It just doesn't work. So if, for example, the government were to try and streamline the BBC, ITN, Channel 4, and tell them all to do the same thing at the same time, can you imagine what you would get on the BBC News that night? It, it would be a bloodbath. You, you cannot do it in a democracy with democratic traditions well, because it's queen? embedded too what's long. The queen? Get the queen on in one, in one go. Right, but, she, but she's not telling them what to say. Yeah. They are all covering the same main event because they have decided that's the big event of the day. I, I'm assuming they are covering us live right now for the same reason, but, but you know, we, can, we can hope. In terms of the democracies, I, th I think the, the bitter pill which democratic governments need to swallow is that in an awful lot of this, the best thing they can do is shut up particularly since Iraq and the, the famous dossier proving that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, um, for a government official to say, we know that the bad guys are doing this because we've got a dossier on it, really doesn't have a great, great deal of credibility. Something which has been very interesting with the, with the Ukrainian conflict is that the people who have been most effective at debunking the Russian myths have been open source, non-governmental actors. There, there's, a, there's a Ukrainian website called Stopfake, um, which specializes in picking up fake news produced both by the Russians and the Ukrainians surrounding the Ukrainian conflict and saying, well, actually, the report was that a child was crucified in Donbass, but actually it's fake for these reasons. Um, that has got a very wide following. That has been picked up a lot by the Western media because it, it is non-governmental, it is independent, and therefore it is seen as more credible. In the same way, there's an investigative journalism group called Bellingcat, who've done a lot of work on social media imagery, and they, they have specialised in finding selfies taken by Russian soldiers on their way from Russia into Ukraine and then in Ukraine, and then they've published them. And so, so if, you know, if Putin is saying that the Russians have no troops on the ground in Ukraine, how come you have a selfie of, of uh, Batal Dambayev and his tank in Ukraine? You could argue that he went on holiday, but was he really allowed to take his tank with him? It's, it's, you know, it's an open question. And that is something which open source people can do far more effectively than governments can because, because by definition governments are seen these days as, as spun, 
they are more liable to, they, they, they are seen, rightly or wrongly, as having an interest in presenting a particular facet of the truth, but not the whole thing. Whereas citizen journalists are, much, are, are seen to be much more likely just to tell it like it is. But journalism is, inc I mean, that's very romantic. I mean, the, uh, you know, um, citizen journalism really doesn't have very many sort of resources to do much journalism with. Classical journalism is famously in a bit of a, a state of uh, degradation, especially when it comes to the boring things like fact-checking and opening bureaus, and mm. that's all going out the window. So, so um, uh, I mean, in the paper you introduced this interesting concept of information defence, which I suppose is a, an attempt to square that circle. Tell yeah. us a little bit more about that. I mean, basically, the, I started coming at this from the idea that in the information <laughs> age, a lie can go around the world in two minutes. So on the 18th of March last year, Putin did his sp big speech about we are now annexing Crimea, as, as Mark has referred to. And one of the things he said at that point, which was the first time any senior Russian official had said it, was that we did this because otherwise Sevastopol would have been a NATO base. Nobody in the Russian government had said before then, we are afraid that Ukraine is about to join NATO. It hadn't come up. But Putin said it's all because they were about to join NATO. Within 20 minutes, that was being reported in the Australian. It was being reported in the Sydney Morning Herald. It was being reported in Auckland and Wellington. So that lie had literally gone around the world in 20 minutes. And that was disinformation. Yeah, there was no talk at that point of Ukraine joining NATO. So these days, if you are concerned about disinformation, and if you are going to wait for the disinformation to come out, you're too late. By the time you have got your act together, 48 hours have elapsed, and again, as, as Mark would tell you, the confusion has been out there for 48 hours and Crimea's gone. And, and this, was the, this was the thing with Putin himself outed himself as a liar. This April in the big um, documentary he did, you know, how I bare-chested rode into Crimea and ripped it off the continental shelf and brought it back to Russia all on my own while bringing back two ancient amphorae under my other arm kind of thing. Um, Putin said himself, yes, I gave the order on the 22nd of, of February, now we need to start returning Crimea. By so doing, he confirmed that the year before, when he had said consistently, nope, none of our guys there, he confirmed that he'd lied. Why did he do that? Because the lie didn't need to stand up anymore. The lie had been crucial from the 22nd of February when he gave the order through to about the 3rd of March, by which time the Russian special forces were fully in control of Crimea, to make sure that the West was so confused and scratching its head it couldn't take any concerted action. So the whole point of disinformation in the modern era is it spreads very fast and it doesn't need to last for long, it just needs to create confusion. Therefore, building on that, if you're going to counter it, if you wait for the disinformation to come out, you're too late. So what you need is preemptive information. And, and an example you can use, if I offer you a cup of tea and you've never drunk tea before, and I say, it's wonderful, it tastes of raspberries. You might well think, oh, it doesn't look like raspberries, but stranger things have happened. If you have already drunk tea, you will know that's rubbish. Tea tastes of tea, not of raspberries. So if you have pre-existing information, it is much harder to disinform you. And in the same way, for example, in Crimea, had there been a stock of Western or, or Western-linked journalists on the ground who've been there for years and know the whole subject and been able to talk straight to sort of BBC head office and the Financial Times and CNN and say, actually, we've been here for ages. There is no separatist movement. There never has been a separatist movement. There certainly hasn't been a separatist movement which has got 2,000 guys with AK-47s. Therefore, this cannot possibly be a genuine separatist movement, and therefore everything you're hearing to the contrary is disinformation. You wouldn't be able to stop the disinformation spreading, but at the same time as it went out, you would be able to say, hang on, there are very serious concerns about this information. And what governments should therefore be concentrating on is, is identifying key areas of concern. Where's going to be the next Crimea? Where's going to be the next Spratly Shoal? And getting not government people, but, but non-governmental people, journalists, NGOs, think tanks, academics, to go to these places and make contacts there and study them and build up a public stock of information, photo, video, audio, satellite imagery, so that if a crisis breaks out there, you already have a stock of, of educated experts who can say, well, hang on, we were there a week ago and we got satellite photos from a week ago and there was nothing there a week ago. So what has, you know, so, so you, you build up the stock of information so that you already know what the tea tastes like. So that when they try and tell you here it tastes of raspberries, you can say no, 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 it doesn't. I have a lot of questions, but we'll, we'll come back yeah. to that because I wanted to, 
Laura, in your conclusions about what to do about Chinese three, the three warfares, mm -hmm. it's, it's vaguely similar. I mean, it's, yeah. this, it's again this idea that you have sort of preemptively creates sort of communities of critical inquiry and evidence before mm -hmm. the problem breaks out. Uh, t tell us a few of the suggestions that you made. Yeah, I think definitely sort of building upon from what Ben was saying, that we need, it, we basically need education and information about what is going on. So, for example, when I was alluding to the fact that China is trying to blur legal distinctions um, or it's trying to blur what um, international law treaties actually say, I think we need uh, education, we need briefings about what's actually happening in the South China Sea. Uh, for example, um, the CNN, they actually had a crew on a, a military warship uh, a US military ship and was able to broadcast signals um, from the Chinese um, ships that were telling them to leave the area, saying that you're within our, um, a, a, an area that's within our territorial sovereignty, you need to leave. So being able to broadcast those, th those kind of things where China is able, where China is trying to blur those distinctions, that is what we need. We need also to prevent um, China being able to um, establish itself as a victim status. So, for example, if you have a military vessel that's uh, exercising a freedom of navigation um, exercise which is uh, legally entitled to and then flooding the area full of fishing vessels or its coast guard and an incursion happens and um, you're able to show that video footage and say look this this is what actually happened and prevent China from saying we're the victim here you did and um, you had um, you were illegally maneuvering so you have all of that video evidence and then you're able to you know maximize on that YouTube effect which ta essentially takes the rug out of China's um, China's feet and wasn't there already a project, the Atlantic Council uh, in the US, which, which sort of does satellite photos nonstop of... Yeah. What, what, what is that again? Exactly. That's the, um, the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative. Um, essentially... So vital they, viewing. They, they, they're taking uh, photographs of all of the different reefs that China are building upon on sort of a, a daily or weekly basis. And they have it all online. So you can see the construction that's happening. So even though China said in August this year, we're going to cease our land reclamation activities. You can see that it's building, you know, it's got three airstrips now um, that are, you know, substantial um, upon each of the, upon, you know, three out of the four reefs that it's reclaimed. So we can see that, well, China is not sticking to its word. Okay, we've got 20 minutes, because today we're going to, I've been told by everyone that we have to finish at 7.30. We've got 20 minutes for questions. Um, when there are questions, uh, uh, a microphone will come round, uh, but please introduce yourselves so that other people know who you are. I'm actually going to ask the first question. The news is full of Syria and Russia, because we, we, yep. we, we were, in terms of narrative uh, maneuvers, the Russian sort of gambit in Syria is, 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 to my mind, quite, from a narrative point of view, in, in its own way, very brilliant. Um, but tell me about sort of, because uh, you've been looking at that quite closely, mm. haven't you? Mm. Uh, and you've managed to see some sort of like um, classic sort of, um, um, sort of uh, narrative and rhetorical sort of techniques being used. That's right, and the, the, the main thing was that President Assad did a very rare one-hour interview with some of the main state Russian media last week, and he was asked a lot about you know, the Syrian crisis, what Syria's relations are with some of its neighbors. He was not asked about what help Syria is getting from Russia, which is curious given that it was Russian journalists asking the questions. But if you read through that speech or that, that, that interview that Assad gave, I, I would swear it was scripted in the Kremlin. It's, it's, it's ticking all the points that Putin and Lavrov have been making that there has to be a military coalition against IS, that the only people of cap capable of fighting IS on the ground are Assad's forces that the, the US-led coalition is totally ineffective, um, that the only reason thousands of people are, or millions of people are fleeing Syria is they are fleeing from IS. No mention of poison gas, no mention of barrel bombs, for example. Um, and, and so they're, they're, it's, it's a rebranding of reality. And Putin started it on the, I think it was the 4th of September, when he was saying, we need a big international coalition, the Americans and their friends just aren't doing it, so, so everybody else needs to join in. Um, and if you look at the way Assad's rhetoric worked, um, there are four, th four key techniques which the Russians use when they, are, when they are issuing propaganda. They will try and dismiss either the critic or the criticism. So they will say, well, if the OSCE monitors say that the rebels were using cluster munitions against civilians, well, the OSCE is biased. They will distort things. So if NATO says we are going to reinforce our, our um, 
our NATO response force, our, our rapid reaction force, and it could be up to 30,000, then, then the same day that happened, the head of the national, Russian National Security Council came out and said, NATO's going to station 30,000 rapid reaction troops in Poland which is pure distortion, they would be based in their home countries and they would be deployed anywhere they were needed. But, but the Russian line from the head of the NSC was, they'll all be in Poland. You know, either he's not very well briefed or that was deliberate. They will distract, so they will say, well, it doesn't matter what we're doing here, what about you did, what you did in Yugoslavia? They will accuse you of the same thing. Or they will try and dismay you. They say, well, if you do that, we, you know, if you're Finland and you're trying to join NATO, well, they'll, you'll be starting World War III. And of those four... Assad was using dismissal. He was saying, well, all the rebels are extremists and the Americans are no good. He was using distortion by saying that well, my forces are the only ones fighting on the ground. Well, tell that to the Kurds. He was using distraction by saying, well, it's all the fault of the Americans and the Europeans. They started the whole crisis because, of, uh, because they were supporting, what was it, the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda and IS. They're all Western constructs. So, so all those things are, are the absolute classic Russian rhetorical techniques. You put that together with Russian journalists interviewing him for the Russian press, clearly with the blessing of Putin, and it's a week before the UN General Assembly. What are they doing? They're floating up all kinds of smoke screens. It's Unger coming up. Putin is going to be under real pressure. What are you doing in Ukraine? What are you doing in Syria? He's trying to turn the rhetorical tables and say, well, it's the fault of the EU and the US. They have to defend themselves. Their coalition hasn't worked. And on the coalition itself, he's saying, we need to have a grand coalition of everybody. He clearly hasn't looked at who's actually doing strikes in Syria at the moment, because it's the Bahrainis, the United Arab Emirates, apart from the US, it's Bahrain, the UAE, Jordan, Turkey, and the Saudis. If you can think of five countries which hate Assad more, you will be doing well. So, so it's Distract, di um, distort, di di dis dismiss, distort, distract, dismay. I'm going to keep this in mind for my next row with my wife. Because this is <laughs> <laughs> the information war is most like Bergman's scenes from marriage, I realise. Um, questions, please. Emma, there's a, I think there's a man in, in the middle. Ewan. Um, thank you very much. Um, Ewan Grant, um, former intelligence analyst in the UK Customs Service for uh, the ex-Soviet countries. Uh, most of my work since I left has been in those countries. The question is for all of you, um, but particularly perhaps for Mr. Laity, given that he's based in Brussels. Um, who is listening to your narratives, which I totally agree with, but I would have very, very grave concerns about some European countries, Western European countries, and particularly the international organizations. Um, when I was working in Moldova, and there's a Mold at least one Moldovan here, I was speaking to um, a European Commission official there who wasn't aware that Kiev had been under German occupation during the Second World War. And I found that non-NATO Brussels has an aversion to soldiers and uniforms, and frankly, a very disturbing naivety. Thank you. Who's well, I think we'll take a few questions. So who's listening? I think that's a very important one. The gentleman at the front. Thank you. Uh, Rudy Bogni. Uh, Allow me to be devil's advocate. I hear you, but I wonder whether information war was not always a tool of war and what has changed is only the speed of communication. And I also wonder whether the fact that there is so much emphasis put on the information war is because the policy war has been lost in many ways. And two examples only, uh, South China Sea, the issue is over 76 years old. You know, the Philippines tried to deal with that issue back in 1949. There is a lot of academic uh, record on the issue. What did the US do except, you know, force the Chinese to spend to death on building up their navy, but that's not really a solution. Example of Crimea. Yeah, Crimea how could it not be on the radar screen? I mean, the Russian uh, policy or, or doctrine regarding uh, access to the Mediterranean and therefore control of the Black Sea is older than the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, 
is it possible that in the United States nobody was watching? So I rest my case and I put it to you that perhaps the information war was always there, is the policy war which is being lost. Okay, so is so how news information works. That's, that's a, a question we wrestle with a lot, actually, and it's, it's, it's a key one. I'm trying to do a book proposal, and it's the first, the first hurdle I'm getting over. How is this new? Um, yeah. Thank you. Confusingly, uh, also, Ewan. Um, Ewan Lawson from Royal United Services Institute, uh, where I work on military influence and a former commanding officer of the uh, UK Psychological Operations Group. Um, the question I have is actually about resource. Um, it strikes me that it doesn't really matter how much we understand the challenge, how much we think about the response, but there is a reluctance certainly in the militaries of, of the Western Alliance to uh, resource these issues. It's not as sexy as exciting as tank ships and aeroplanes. Uh, would the panel like to comment on that? Thank you. I think we should start answering those because they're really very, very key questions. Um, we don't all need to answer all of them. Do, do, do you have any particular desires, Mark, um, out, out of those well, three? I can Actually, um, in a way, they're linked. The, the first question, which is about do the Europeans, in effect, you're saying, do the Europeans get it? I think I should add here that I am speaking in a personal capacity, um, not for NATO, um, to make that point. Um, you've got 28 nations in NATO. You've got 28 nations in the EU. They don't all overlap, so it's a lot more. Some of them care more than others. Often it's geography. Some care more about the southern flank. Some care more about the eastern flank. It's unrealistic to expect them all to agree. The reason I highlighted the narrative arc is that in the end, and I agree with everything that Laura and Ben said, unless you know what you want, to, unless you agree on the problem, you can't decide what you're going to do with it. Um, and unless you have an end state, you're not going to get there. So we have to, one of the issues with with the Russian federations. In fact, if you look at what they have done with Russia, it is a compromise. Some nations cared more than others. Some nations worried more. But they did implement sanctions, all of them, and they have held. So I'm not, I hear you, and I, I genuinely do. Is it as strong as many nations would like? No. But actually, they managed to agree a common policy of sanctions and other actions, and they keep working together to do it. And, and that goes into the, the, this kind of informed versus policy that you're making. Um, the issue is, in a way, to use another analogy. Um, yes, information warfare has been with us since Sun Tzu. But the point is that sometimes things change. We are now in not just the information age, we're in the engagement age. We've, we've moved beyond almost information. So, in a way, if you think back to aeroplanes when they first started in 1914, what did they do? Well, they were long-range artillery and they were reconnaissance. They were cavalry. So they were cavalry with long range. But as air power developed, it transformed the whole nature of warfare. Now, what has happened now is that you've got the old principles, the Sun Tzu, they still apply. But information through the internet, through all of the things that's happening, has been transformative. So in that sense, yes, you're right, it's old. But also you're wrong because the nature of the new has transformed how we use information. And that then requires resources as well. So I go for the three. Yes, the interesting thing though with resources is that the price of a typhoon would very adequately fund um, the whole information effort. So actually information stuff is pretty good value um, if you're prepared to put in a few millions when many things cost a few billions. Mark, well, after that virtuoso effort, Laura, do you want to jump in or should we move on to more questions? So I think you covered, you covered all the bases there very, very fluidly. The, the, the one thing I think I'd add on the question of you know, why didn't anybody see Crimea coming, if you've read John Keegan's Intelligence in War, one of the points he makes from, from the Cyprus campaign is it doesn't matter how good your intelligence is if you don't do anything about it. And so, so there is that, that essential problem that if, if you, you, you can, or another example, you know, the Soviets had months of intel from every possible source that Barbarossa was going to happen, but they just decided it was not true. So, so no matter how good your intelligence, there has to be the political will to A, believe it, and B, do something about it. And actually, out of that, it's arguable, you see, I'm not sure, it's one of the great unanswered. Um, was that always the plan? Or did Putin decide pretty late? 
obviously they had a plan to take Crimea. They got a damn great base there. So if they hadn't had a plan on the shelf, ready to go, then they, that would be mad. But why did they decide to take it down there? Was that inevitable? So it wasn't whether they could, it was knowing whether they would. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm genuinely not sure that was the plan. I mean, they just lost Kiev, not Crimea. Next question. Two gentlemen uh, in glasses at the back. What's well, sort of not, yeah. I'm an undergraduate student of work studies at King's College, and my question is for all of you. With firm international dismissal of Russia's narrative on the Ukraine crisis, uh, the real challenge seems to be the foothold that said narrative has within Russia, among Russians, uh, thanks to state domination of media. How can Ukraine and its international allies counter this information warfare within Russia? Thank you. I'm Chris Powers, building on that. I'm here as a, uh, in a personal capacity. Um, just building on, on the point that Mark referred to at the end, I mean, the Russians sound brilliant, right? I mean, with this strategic narrative that was, they've been delivered and implemented. To me, often it looks as if they're, they're responding to a series of tactical uh, maneuvers almost and, and dictated in many ways by domestic policy. Are we giving them too much credit? Are they that good? It's a very good question. Um, I mean, with, with the... Uh, it's not actually, um, I wouldn't feel too as confident as you might think about the rejection of Russia's narrative. Because Russian narrative isn't, um, it isn't stuff about the fascist junta. No one cares about that. That's the narrative. The overall narrative is that Europe is nothing as mm. united as it makes out. And that NATO Article 5 is actually a bit of a joke. That's the, the strategic narrative. The hunter stuff can be dismissed tomorrow, it doesn't matter. They'll think of a new one. All, that, all those little things, they're really not important. Um, is the EU as allied and is the transatlantic alliance as tight? I don't think that answer is, right. uh, that answer is um, fully, ans yeah. that answer is fully clear yet. So far sanctions have held, but whether they will into next year, if there's enough of a, a narrative sort of a pitch to some countries in the EU, maybe sanctions will disappear. I mean, if in a year's time, um, most of the sanctions have been removed, Crimea is off the agenda, it's already off the agenda, uh, and Russia is you know, part of some international alliance to at least formally battle terrorism, and that, all that stuff has disappeared, then I'd say they've actually won. Um, it's not about the little lies they tell along the way. They all feed into a much bigger process. It's a very good question. I mean, the, the, you know, it's one we've puzzled, as mm. Peter implied. The thing is, I think there's some things that we can acknowledge that they've done well which is that um, we talked earlier about being effects-based. They didn't care, as Ben said, about whether we believed they were lying or not. What they cared about was confusing us and delaying our decision-making until they'd taken Crimea. You know, the military term is getting inside your opponent's decision-making cycle. They got inside the decision-making cycle. So at that point, the lie had done its job. They are not, in many respects, if you look at, say, Russia Today or RT, I mean, do people know what its slogan is? Its slogan is question more. It's not love Russia. It's question more. And that's because what they actually do, if you look at Russia Today, uh, which many of us have the misery of having to do, <laughs> um, what you see consistently is them dissing the West. They're not saying... Putin is wonderful, when he's on, he's wonderful. But they put most of their effort into actually undermining the West. You know, the US is racist and hopeless. The EU is decadent. It's always the problems, the problems, the problems. And that question more narrative, where is the zeitgeist we're in now? The zeitgeist we're in now is governments are rubbish. You know, certain party leaders are elected because they're authentic. Not because of their policies, but because they don't trust anyone. So when the Russians go for the question more narrative, what they're doing is they're going into a zeitgeist that affects us all. And what that then does is how do you make decision making when nobody trusts no one? So it's a very, it's a much more subtle thing. Your point is good because I think they're improvising, but behind that, they're well trained, they've got proper doctrine, they've got enough money, and therefore at the tactical level they can do good stuff. And they've achieved their aims so far, but whether 
they have bitten off more than they can chew. That's a good point. Let's hope so. Um, in terms of, and to connect that to the domestic thing, in the near abroad, there is actually, actually one narrative. I mean, it's sophisticated when we talk about EU alliances. It's like, we are the strongest. You know, don't mess with us. Don't even think these faraway Americans don't care about you. These people in Germany, they don't really care about you. You're with us forever. Don't even think about going anywhere. That's really yeah. the one narrative, actually both domestically and to sort of the near abroad, yeah. that we are the biggest and toughest and most dedicated and most sort of uh, emotionally committed here. Um, and so when we talk about sort of, uh, um, you know, on the sort of grand strategic level of uh, subverting the uh, Kremlin's narrative at home and in the near abroad, it's to show that actually people aren't scared of them. So a lot of the time it's, it's, it's really on that very, very simple schoolyard level. Um, I just finished, if you want a long sort of explanation of um, how, does, um, how do you deal with sort of the Kremlin's use of media domestically or for Russian audiences in the near abroad, there's a huge uh, report I finished for the European Endowment for Democracy recently where we went into a whole long strategy just for media development, not for sort of political strategy, but just for media development. And in a, in a line, it's, it's um, you know, uh, the alternative to endless disinformation and endless narrative in the form of mythologizing is sort of a return to reality. So it's very boring things, like a, a Russian language news agency. There isn't one. There just isn't a Russian Reuters. Uh, there used to be a real novelty that was destroyed. Mm. So any kind of return in the media space to but to, to the reality of everyday life is, is what's needed. But that's not quite the same thing as the grand political strategy. That's the sort of media uh, strategy that's needed. Yes. Uh, uh, please wait for the thing. Yes. Um, one of the things that Russia is very good at is setting the political lexicon. And I just wanted to pick up on this use of near abroad. That's straight translation from the Russian. Um, Sorry. It, I mean, it's, 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 I'm, a, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a secret linguistic agent. Yeah, I mean, from a Russian point of view, these countries are near. That isn't necessarily the way, the way they see it. And I think we need to be quite careful about... Um, I mean, there, there are synonyms like ex-captive nations, which are just as good. <laughs> I, I think that's incredible. That, I think that's absolutely uh, uh, um, accurate. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I have. I was told off by a Latvian ambassador recently for something similar. But you're not the only one using it. Everybody is using it. It's not yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. Mm. Yeah. No, 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 you're quite right, sorry. Uh, there's two questions then. That wasn't a question, that was a ticking off from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Flavia. I'm a student. I also run a non-profit focused on Eastern European studies. Um, you've all referred to um, strategic narratives and information warfare with regards to the big players, I would say, such as NATO, Russia, China. But I was wondering whether there's any scope to focus or even referred to the concept of a narrative with regards to former Soviet republics, because it is my understanding and from my experience in Moldova, as well as in Ukraine, Belarus, that these countries usually form their narratives around the narratives created by the big players, such as Russia, such as NATO. And we've seen the struggle ever since 1991 between <coughs> Europe on the one hand, or the EU, NATO, and then Russia on the other hand. And there's sort of a struggle for these countries to affiliate with either the East or the West. So they form their narratives, they construct them through the media in, according, in accordance with their political affiliations. So it, I, my question would therefore be, is there any scope for these countries to form their own narratives independently of these big players? Yeah, absolutely, and they should. I mean, that's the whole point. Um, I do a, in a, the longer lecture, you know, you're lucky you didn't get it. Um, I, do, um, I do a thing called the narrative tree. And the core narrative and has roots and they go into the soil and the <coughs> soil is education, culture, history, experience, family. So, you know, one of the core things about a nation and I've, I've worked in nations where their identity has actually been an issue. I mean, I, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, you know, a wonderful nation, not allowed its own name. So they are people who actually need to sit down and have a debate about what they are and where they're going. And the thing they need to do is to look at what they are, not be <coughs> driven by those around them. Because it's only when you plumb into the depths of your culture that you can create a narrative that will speak to your people. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. That, and it can be done. I mean, the, it's not, the narrative is not the hard bit, the implementation and following it through. 
That's the tough bit, but the um, narrative is just work. Final comment, because then yeah, uh, sorry. We'll, sorry, we'll have to end today at 7.30. Um, yes, they do. Uh, all the, all the, 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 the former captive nations are drawing up their own narratives. A lot of what we see going on is when those narratives cl clash with primarily with Russia. And, and a classic example of that would be the, the bronze soldier in Tallinn in 2007, where the Estonian government said, this is a war memorial to the Red Army soldiers who occupied our country. We're going to move it to a war cemetery. And this was seen in the Russian media as an assault on the sacred memory of the Red Army who had liberated the country. For the Estonians, and for many you know, ethnic Russians living in Estonia at that point, the Red Army occupation was when they were stuck up against a wall and shot. It is not something they celebrate as a great heroic achievement. For the Russians, the victory of the Red Army is, is, is their, their core belief, their core religion. That was their great thing in their history. And so what drove the riots in Tallinn was that clash of the two narratives, where the Estonians saying, look, calm down, guys. It's a war memorial. We're moving it to a war cemetery. But for the Russians, it was an attack on, on their core narrative and their core self-belief. And that's, what, that's, that's the problem they have, that you can establish your own narrative, but it's how that narrative then interacts with the narratives of other bigger players it is where the, co the problems come up. Yeah, just quickly, I definitely yeah, no. think that's the, the case for China as well, though they're not directly within a sphere of influence. I think what's happening with the South China Sea is it's almost emboldening the smaller nations to um, directly develop their own narrative with the support of the West and the US. So, for example, you look at Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, um, you know, or Taiwan even, all of these different nations are able to, to use the South China Sea as um, sort of a turning point where they can develop their own narrative to sort of as a, to fight back against this, this larger China narrative that this is all within China's sphere of influence, China's the greatest power, um, you shouldn't be moving towards Washington, you shouldn't be moving towards the US. So th in, in certain instances, the South China Sea is sort of a, a point of departure for smaller nations, smaller literal and other claimants within the South China Sea to be able to develop that divergent narrative. We've got to finish, I'm sorry. Uh, we're just going to be really strict for this today. Usually we go on and on and on. But, <laughs> but, 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 for those of you not celebrating Yom Kippur, there are drinks and nibbles uh, just here, I think, or downstairs. Just here? Just here. So there's uh, some of the w lovely Legatum wine and the uh, our incredible crisps. <laughs>